Hey everybody, welcome to All Team Academy. I am your host, Zach Peterson, also your local technical consultant for All Team. And today we're gonna to be looking at a viewer question. And this question is about why the PDN impedance spectrum has the shape that it does. So we've covered this in a couple of other videos, but what I'm actually gonna do in this video is look at the mathematics behind it and actually derive the shape of a PDN impedance spectrum. And you will be able to see which circuit parameters dominate the shape of that PDN impedance spectrum. Let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so before we jump into the mathematics of a PDN impedance spectrum, let's take a look at the viewer question. Engineer writes, Hi Zach, thank you for your terrific playlist. I found every video extremely useful. You're cool, I wish you good luck in the next videos. I have a question. Why did you draw the equivalent impedance spectrum for a PDN considered the way you did? Hope you see it, thank you. Well, thanks engineer. So to understand why the shape of a PDN impedance spectrum is the way it is, we need to look at the equivalent circuit model for a PDN in a PCB. So as we've covered in a few other videos, the reason that a PDN has the shape it does is because of the decoupling capacitors that are used in a PDN, as well as the plane capacitance, the trace inductance, the spreading inductance in the plane, and any other parasitics that might exist in the PDN, particularly the resistance in both the capacitor leads, as well as the resistance of the copper that makes up all the connections in the PDN. Going back to the previous video on controlled ESR capacitors, when we looked at the PDN impedance spectrum, and specifically the magnitude versus frequency, what we had in that video was a curve that looked something kind of like this. So this is really rough, but essentially this would correspond to one frequency, F1, for capacitor, let's say C1, and then this might correspond to frequency number two for capacitor C2. Now, sometimes if you've seen these graphs drawn, you actually won't see it smooth out like this. They might draw it something kind of like this, where it goes down into these really sharp peaks, comes up into these really sharp peaks, and so on and so forth, and then continues off into higher frequencies. Now, there's actually a way you can derive this shape if you just consider the decoupling capacitors that are used in a PDN. So in that previous video, we were looking at a specific type of capacitor called a controlled ESR capacitor. Now in those capacitors, they try to guarantee a specific equivalent series resistance value in those capacitors. So the reason that they do that with those capacitors is not necessarily for high speed power integrity. It's actually done for power regulators and for other power systems. They want to ensure that the discharge rate in those very large capacitors can be controlled to a specific value. And in order to do that, you have to be able to control the equivalent series resistance on those capacitors. So that is one of the reasons why they do that with those components. Now in a high speed digital system, could you technically use a controlled ESR capacitor in this system? You probably could. You have to check that it's actually going to be able to discharge fast enough. But what we actually looked at in that video was how the resistance influences this rounding off of this spectrum if you actually calculate this. So now let's go ahead and jump in, consider the equivalent circuit model for these capacitors, and then we can actually calculate the shape of this curve. So for this discussion, we start by looking at the equivalent circuit for a capacitor. And if you're familiar with the equivalent circuit for a capacitor, it's essentially a series RLC circuit. So we have our uh, ESR value here, and I'm just gonna write this in the preceding discussion as just R. So this is our equivalent series resistance. We have our capacitance, and then we have our equivalent series inductance. Normally this would be written ESL for what comes next. I'm just gonna use L. And so what we wanna do is calculate the impedance of this circuit when we have, let's say, N of these capacitors all in parallel. So we have N of these all uh, wired up in parallel. Now normally if I had, let's say, two capacitors and they were wired up in parallel like this and I connected them with copper on a PCB, you would have some connection down here but in this intervening connection between these two capacitors, let's say if this were on the surface layer of a PCB, um, you have a very small section of trace that actually has some inductance as well as some very small resistance. We're just gonna ignore that for the moment and just assume that we have just a straight across 
resistanceless and inductanceless connection, so no resistance, no inductance, between these two capacitors. In order to calculate the impedance of N of these in parallel, what we can do is calculate the impedance for a capacitor, we'll just say Z1, and then we'll consider another capacitor with different values here, and then we'll see how they add together to give us an equivalent impedance in parallel. So first things first, when we have a series RLC circuit, we know that the impedance of our RLC circuit number one is just the resistance plus the impedance from the inductance plus the impedance from the capacitance. And doing just a little bit of math, we can rewrite this as R plus I omega uh, L. And if I just factor this out, I essentially get one minus the natural frequency squared over the frequency squared. So this is the impedance for just one of those capacitors. Now, if we take, let's say two of these and wire them up in parallel, then we know that one over the equivalent impedance for those two capacitors is gonna be one over, let's say Z1 plus one over Z2. So let's just assume for a moment that they have different natural frequencies. So my Z1 here is going to correspond to a natural frequency number one. And then I'll have another Z2 or impedance for capacitor number two corresponding to natural frequency number two. So just for a moment, we'll consider these to be different. If I take this, plug it into this, write out another equation for Z2, I can then see how these two things add together. So let's go ahead and do that now. So my equivalent impedance is just gonna be one divided by this factor here in the denominator. And then we'll have another one here. And I'll go ahead and write it on the next line just for clarity. But we're gonna have R plus I omega L and one minus omega zero two squared over omega squared. Here, we have our capacitances and our inductances lumped together into these natural frequencies. And I can simplify this a little bit just by multiplying the top and bottom by omega squared. And I factor this in, and I then get something that looks like this. This is what this expression looks like for these two things in parallel. Then if I add these together and I invert this, then I have the total impedance. This simplifies a little bit if we were to essentially multiply out these denominators uh, so that they have a common denominator and then we can add this all up and invert it. So it gets a little tricky here and the expression gets a little complicated to look at, but I think what's important here is that we can look at the admittance, since we're dealing with an impedance, and we can analyze what happens with that and then infer what happens to these different peaks in this spectrum. We have a few things that we can look at here. First, we'll notice that if our angular frequency is exactly equal to one of our natural frequencies, then we get a zero down here in the denominator. And this equation is gonna reduce a little bit and it's gonna be easier to work with. If we're very far away from our natural frequencies, then one over the equivalent impedance is gonna be a very small number. And so as a result, this could then become, when we invert it, a very large number. And that gives us our peaks in the PDN impedance spectrum. So now I want to examine what happens at each of these critical points. So we have two critical points in this equation. First one is the natural frequency of capacitor number one, and then the natural frequency of capacitor number two, and then we can examine what happens in between those frequencies. So first, let's just assume that we're exactly at the natural frequency of capacitor number one. Well, if this is the case, this term here in the denominator is zero, and so our equivalence impedance is approximately one over R, and then plus this other term here. So what happens to this other term? Well, we're subtracting here, but these two things aren't equal. So we're gonna have something that's on the order of, let's say one gigahertz squared, 10 to the 18th power, so that's pretty big. We're multiplying that by something that's on the order of one, so we can ignore that, and that's just one times 10 to the 18th. Here, we're taking 10 to the 18th, but we're multiplying it by something that's approximately 10 to the 16th, let's say, because this is gonna be on the order of maybe 10 milliohms, just for the resistance, or smaller if you're dealing with large planes. So in that case, we're gonna have something that's essentially one over R plus a small number. If you realize that one over R is actually going to be a rather large number, you're gonna essentially have this be reducing to the inverse of the equivalent impedance is just approximately the inverse of the resistance. So remember, our R here 
is on the order of maybe, let's say one to 10 milliohms. So if that's the case, when we invert this, our impedance is going to be approximately one to 10 milliohms. So if we were to look at this on a graph, then our equivalent impedance essentially has just reached its first dip in the spectrum. So this is right here at omega zero one. And once we go beyond that, we would then eventually wanna see what happens right here at omega zero two. So there's gonna be something else right here at omega zero two. It's either gonna be a maximum or a minimum. Well, we just follow the exact same logic that we did before. Instead of having omega equals omega O one, we have it equal to omega O two. So now this term is zero, this fraction is small, this uh, fraction is gonna be large, and then we're gonna be left again with one over this resistance. So again, we'd have a dip here, or a minimum, right here at omega zero two. In between these values, what we're going to have for the case of, let's say, omega zero one less than omega, less than omega zero two, so we're in between the natural frequencies, now we're again gonna get this to a point where it's essentially small number plus another small number. So in between these two values, we know that we have the inverse of the equivalent impedance is a small number. That means the equivalent impedance is gonna be a big number. We take the inverse of something small, we get something big. So that essentially means that in between these values, impedance must be increasing. And so eventually it hits this peak. And that's what we saw in the spectrum that I drew earlier. You'll see this in other calculations of impedance spectra or in measurements of impedance spectra. So in between each of these natural frequencies, there's gonna be a peak somewhere. Now the height of that peak is really gonna depend on these slopes and where those slopes cross over. And so it's a little difficult to generalize it the way we did for the natural frequencies, but at some point you get a maximum and then you return to the next minimum. And then you go over to the next maximum and then the next minimum and so on and so forth. So that's why you get this peaking behavior in the PDN impedance spectrum. It's all about treating those decoupling capacitors as RLC circuits. So is a real PDN essentially just a bunch of decoupling capacitors in parallel? Not exactly. I mean, there are decoupling capacitors in the PDN if you need to support high-speed components, but that's not the only thing that's in a PDN. So those series RLC circuits just represent the capacitors. As I mentioned before, we have the plane capacitance, we have the trace inductance, we have the spreading inductance, and some other factors. So if you wanna see everything that goes into a more comprehensive PDN simulation, what I would like you to do is go check out the link in the description. There's a link to one of our other videos where we do some SPICE simulations with these PDN impedance models, and you can get a little bit better sense of all of the different circuit elements that are used in these type of circuit-based PDN simulations. And with that, thanks for watching this video. I'd like to invite you to subscribe. You can keep up to all of our new videos as they come out. And of course, leave your comments and questions in the comments section. And you can also email us your questions at YouTube at allteam.com. All right, that's it to everybody. Thank you so much. And last but not least, don't forget to call your fabricator, folks.